everybody. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. This is apparently the base version of Board Game Breakfast. I delayed it a little bit because I hoped that my voice would get better. It is apparently not. However, I do sound a bit more manly, as, as you can see. Now, I'm going to be going this week to the GTS Trade Show. This is one of the largest distributors of games, GTS distribution. And um, I'll be able to talk to publishers and see some games that are coming out and hopefully talk to different people there. And so we'll be getting some video of that. So hopefully you'll see some of that stuff next week. Um, so that's gonna change things up this week a little bit how things go. I was going to do a live q and I know we haven't done those for a couple weeks because of Essen and all, but I think that I should rest my voice somewhat. Uh, although this does sound like a pretty good way to do live Q&A. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Also, the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund auction starts on Board Game Geek this week. So keep an eye out for that. And then finally, the Dice Tower Convention is less than 30 days away. Please go to DiceTowerCon.com and bookmark that page. On that page is a counter as to when registration goes live, which I think is like 27 days or something like that. You don't want to miss that because it will sell out. And you don't want to, you know, regret not getting tickets. If, if nothing else, if you think you're going to go, go register, get some tickets. And then if you can't, someone else will probably buy those from you later on. Because, again, the show is sold out. So please keep that on your calendars. All right, guys, let's get to the news. Not a lot of news today. Um... Most of the big stuff is from Kickstarter, still going on right now, but more news will be coming. Gray Fox Games was a uh, publishing arm of Cool Stuff Incorporated. They are now split off into their own companies, two separate entities. They, they've grown big enough. They're going to have their own independence, and they're the ones who made Champions of Midgard a great game, and check that one out. The Essen Spiel Fair has announced their numbers, 162,000 turnstiles. It's always hard to gauge these numbers. I wish they would actually give us numbers of unique attendees. I found that in the past, unique attendance uh, is usually half of turnstile. So probably 80,000 people went. That's still a big number, but I don't know. It's, it's, again, it's, it's really hard to tell how many folks uh, were at Essen, but it's still pretty big. Although it's 162,000, last year was 160,000, so maybe it's leveling out. Who knows? Uh, certainly isn't leveling out exhibitor-wise. It was 910 exhibitors. That's just a, a mind-blowing amount of people who were there. Matigo is known for making deluxe games, wonderful games, and they made that deluxe version of Takinoko that a lot of people liked. Well, now they're making one of River Dragons. They had a few copies shown off of Spiel. I saw it. It's beautiful. I have a copy coming, but it was too big for me to, to bring back in my suitcase, so I had to ship it on the pallet, so it might be a while before you see that one, um, but it's really a nice version of the game. Well, earlier this month, we had the Dice Tower People's Choice Top 100 Games of All Time for 2015 drop. Huh. I wonder if I'm going to talk about that. I mean, just because I started Wikipedia a year ago with like a six-part maxi-series that crunched all kinds of crazy statistics about the People's Choice doesn't mean I'm going to do it again. Oh, wait, I did. Now, last year, I did a lot of number crunching and comparisons. Mainly, I compared the People's Choice to the Board Game Geek Top Games list, which certainly wasn't new. Tom has been saying for years that the People's Choice is a better gauge of what games people are playing now than Board Game Geek is. I posited that the best gauge of popularity of games is to go to BGG and click on the number of votes per game, which is better at measuring how broad a game's reach is rather than how deeply devoted some of its fans are. Then I compared all three of these lists. The standard BGG list, the People's Choice, and then the Geek Voters list, as I call it. Last year, the People's Choice and the Geek Voters list lined up very well. They shared nine out of the same top ten games. However, that's not the case this year. The top ten for number of votes has actually not changed on Board Game Geek. It's still Catan, Carcassonne, Dominion, Pandemic, Puerto Rico, Agricola, Ticket to Ride, Seven Wonders, Power Grid, and Small World. This year, only half those games are on the People's Choice. Pandemic, Seven Wonders, Ticket to Ride, Small World, and Dominion. Honorable mention to Carcassonne, which was number 11. Of the remaining games of those top 10, Puerto Rico is still clinging to a respectable 59, Agricola refuses to give up a 35, Settlers actually climbed a few spaces to 21, and Power Grid is a remarkable 18. 
remarkable because the number I always associate with power grid is one. And I played it once and that was enough for me. So with these big standbys, these titans of gaming slipping, is it a sign that the Dice Tower is becoming even cult of the new year than we talk about all the time? Well, that's a question we'll answer next week. It's called Blood Rage by Kulaminia Knot, designed by Eric Lang. This game places the players in control of several Viking clans who seek to gain the most glory during the destruction of the world. These clans will call upon the favor of the gods to help further their goals as well as battle other clans. The game plays over three ages. In each age, the clans will first curry favor from the gods by drafting from a hand of eight cards. These cards can provide strong upgrades to a clan, provide combat abilities and bonuses, as well as quests that a clan may complete for more glory. After the players have drafted a hand of six cards, they move on to the action phase, where they spend their rage to take various actions, such as placing units onto the game board, moving units, buying upgrades, pillaging, and laying down quest cards. As the players take these actions, they'll be vying for control over several regions on the game board. These regions hold bonuses that players may pillage if they defeat other clans' troops. Pillaging increases corresponding clan stats. Each clan has three of these, Rage, Axes, and Horns. Rage is the amount of rage you start each age with. Axes is the amount of glory you gain for winning a battle, and Horns is the number of units you can have on the board at one time. After all players have depleted their rage, they will have an opportunity to complete the quest they laid down earlier, and then one of the provinces on the map will be destroyed due to Ragnarok. After this, all figures that are in Valhalla are sent back to their players and a new age will begin. The player with the most glory after all three ages will be the winner. Who will quake in fear as the world ends and be consumed in the destruction of Ragnarok? What clan will rise above the others and take their place as the most glorious warriors in all of the world? So hopefully I'll be able to get out a lot of reviews this week, just probably in a deeper voice. So one of the cool reviews I'm looking forward to talking about are the Justice League Hero Dice game. And also I'll be taking a look at the Pursuit of Happiness and Dice City, the expansions for Roll for the Galaxy and for Race for the Galaxy, the expansions for Mafia, Farscape Foundry, Outfoxed. So there's a lot of stuff coming this week. Z and Sam will also be doing a full press a uh, bunch of reviews coming from them and we're going to continue each day you'll see us playing a game of pandemic legacy so that will continue all throughout this week i think we'll get one of our one of my favorite games is going to happen this week in that regard also the dice tower tomorrow is going to be um posted in which we will be talk we just answer a pile of questions trying to catch up on the questions the question palooza and of course a lot of other great shows are found on our webpage, dicetower.com. So those are some of the things you've been looking forward to this week. Oh yeah, a top 10 list. We'll be doing um, two top 10 lists. One, uh, one of our pop culture, our top 10 adventure action movies, but our gaming one is our top 10 essentials for having in a gaming room. As Marler from Pair of Dice, Paradise here, with the second half of my list of board game card storage ideas. Okay, let's not waste any time. Let's continue right on with the final three. Number three, Hugo's Amazing Tape. Hugo's Amazing Tape is a tape made of PVC that doesn't use any sort of adhesive glues, but still sticks to itself and only itself. It comes in a variety of lengths and widths, just like tape, which makes it an excellent choice for securing decks of cards. Now, I only discovered Hugo's Amazing Tape earlier this year, so I can't speak to any long-term effects that it may have on cards. However, I did find a Hugo's Amazing Tape public service announcement thread on BoardGameGeek.com, which, while still singing the praises of the self-sticking stuff, did mention how it could potentially damage board game components in some cases. 
So, if you're using Hugo's Amazing Tape to organize, repair, wrap, or bundle, I suggest giving that forum post a read. Number 2. Ultra Pro Acrylic Deck Boxes Acrylic deck boxes are perhaps my favoriteest card storage solution. They can even contain cards and components from a game all together in one nice tidy little package. But because of this, they're not as compact as other solutions, so not every board game's box is going to be big enough to contain them. It's a pity, and it makes them like a double-edged sword, except that they're rectangular, have no blade, and are not at all sword-like. But they've also become more difficult to find over the years. None of my local stores of any kind carry them anymore, so I've had to start ordering them online. So, if you are interested in acrylic deck boxes, I would suggest looking online for them first. Number 1. Homemade Tuck Boxes Perhaps the most customized solution on this list is homemade tuck boxes. These provide a custom fit for the cards in your collection, and all you need is one of the tuck box patterns that's available online, some heavy paper to print them on, a printer, scissors, glue, and that can-do spirit that made this country great. But anyway, this card storage solution requires far more work than the others on this list, but you know, Having a game's various decks, each housed within a custom tuck box designed specifically for it, can be a very, very satisfying result. So there you go! There's my list of six board game storage suggestions! Are there any I missed? Any I repeated? Did I mention the amazing tape? What year is this? Let me know in the comments below! Game Brawl, and over on my channel, I reviewed six games recently. Let's take a look at them from worst to best. First is One Night Revolution from Indie Boards and Cards. I despise One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which was the forebearer of this game, despite the fact that I really enjoy social hidden deduction games. People promised me that One Night Revolution would be slightly better, rethemed into the Resistance universe. Yes, but it's still terrible, boring, pointless. I would never play this game over any other social deduction game, including The Resistance. Then is Coup, uh, Coup Rebellion G54, also a version of Coup rethemed into the Resistance universe. It's fine. The thing is, even though it's completely incompatible with the original Coup, it is Coup. It's the exact same game with a more complicated setup and more roles to choose from. I don't really understand why they couldn't just be mixed together. Uh, then there is Neon City Rumble, which is a game that gets by a lot on its theme. It's got this retro 1990s beat-em-up Kung Fury type feel to it. Love the artwork. The battle system is okay, but I think a lot of people will enjoy it just for the retro feel. Then there's Timeline Challenge. Now, Timeline is a game that I like, but is more of an activity than anything else. But this one takes uh, a new set of cards for Timeline, plus you can mix in all the other ones if you want to, and makes it into a bigger, more grandiose trivia game, and it's really enjoyable. It's frustrating, but it's fun. Mafia de Cuba gets an expansion in the form of the Revolution Expansion, which is just adding more variety of roles to the base game. It's solid. You may not need it for the base game to have fun, but I still like the variety of extra stuff, and it just makes a good game even better. And finally, there is Between Two Cities from Stonemaier Games. This is definitely a gateway game, and a very intriguing one at that, where you're building cities between uh, the two people to your left and right, and only your lowest score of the two cities is going to count at the end. Tile laying, set collection. It's very basic, but it's also very fun as well. That's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Hello, my friends. It's the Game Boy Geek here. Last week, I reviewed Queen's Necklace. And although it's from Bruno Cathala and Bruno Faduti, I wanted to love it. But in the end, it just felt way too random, way too unbalanced, and too complex for a non-gamer, and too random and crazy for a gamer. So it didn't sit well with me. Shakespeare. Uh, I think this is a good solid Euro game that a lot of Euro players are going to like. Personally though, I love the theme, I love the artwork, but I felt like it was a little too unforgiving because there's a very small scores in the 20s that gets done, and I felt like you were forced to do things evenly at some point to make sure you don't get whacked with bad points. So in the end, uh, there were things about it I didn't like, but I could see a lot of people really liking this. Now, Snow Tales is a reprint from Renegade Games, originally from Fraggle Games. This is a racing game where you're playing cards, huge on my depth to complexity ratio, easy rules, not complex, but a good amount of depth there, really fun racing game, that one's great. 
between two cities from Stonemaier Games. Wow, this is a three to seven player quick city tile drafting game where you're working cooperatively with people next to you but against everyone else. Think of like Seven Wonders playing really fast but without that, all that complexity but you're city building and you're working with people. Awesome, awesome filler game. Uh, Deception, The Murder in Hong Kong. Wow, this is probably one of my favorite social deduction games now. It's got a deduction element, you got a social deduction element, you're trying to solve a crime, figure out who the murderer is, and it's very similar. If Resistance Avalon and Mysterium had a baby, this game would be it. Go check that one out. And Time Stories. Whoa, this one took me by surprise. I didn't think this was my style. I didn't think I was going to like it. I was absolutely blown away by the story here, the artwork, the way it worked, and I've never felt so just engulfed into a story of a game before Time Stories. Hello everyone, three reviews for you this week. First we have the Revolution expansion for Mafia de Cuba. Add some new roles. If you like the base game at all, definitely pick this up. It actually made me appreciate the roles that come in the base game a little bit more by changing up the meta. Pretty cool stuff. Next is the expansion for Castles of Mad King Ludwig, Secrets. Uh, really great expansion, adds a lot. You can kind of plug and play some of the different modules and you can kind of tailor your experience. I like to throw everything in. Really, really fun, really escalates the game and takes it to the next level. Uh, finally, we have Between Two Cities. This is a very light a three to seven player drafting game. There are rules for less players, but it's very almost like a gateway drafting game. Components are outstanding. Everything is great. So good introductory drafting game. Thanks. This week, I was able to review this little gem right here, uh, Raptor. And Raptor is a two-player game where one player takes the role of the scientist and another player takes the role of the uh, Raptor family. The Raptors are trying to escape off the board and the scientists are trying to capture some of those baby Raptors for scientific research. Really cool two-player game, has hand management and grid movement on the board. Uh, check it out if you have not yet so far. And then I was also able to review this little guy from, uh, both of these are actually from Essen, and uh, this one is Carcassonne, the Star Wars edition. It's Carcassonne with a Star Wars theme thrown on top of it. Uh, but it does have some extra elements in there, some dice rolling, some combat. Um, <laughs> and then my third video this week was Battling Brushes. It's a new series that I'm starting with Rob Oren, who is also on Board Game Breakfast. And uh, we are painting the miniatures from Star Wars Imperial Assault. And then we're going to do a live playthrough at the end of the, at the, end of the month. And then next month, during the Jack Basil Memorial uh, Fund auction, we're going to be auctioning that copy off with a little couple extras added into it. So, that's me. Oh, hi there, YouTube. I'm Forrest from Bowers Game Corner. This is my week in review. The first game I had a chance to check out was the DC deck building Team Titans game slash expansion. This is my first time playing with Cryptozoic's deck building system, and wow, I'm a big fan. It plays up to five players, has gorgeous artwork. Everybody's got their own unique superpowers, which is really cool. I will say the theme, yes, is a little bit destroyed from the game, but still one I highly recommend. Can't wait to explore more. Next, I checked out Kill Dr. Lucky, the 19 and a half anniversary edition from Cheap Ass Games, currently on Kickstarter, already funded. It is a fun, lighter weight family game that plays up to eight players, which is a big thumbs up. There are some concerns, though. I feel like the theme is just a little bit too dark for a lot of families. The seven and eight players stretches out just a bit too long, and the Kickstarter price seems a little bit high, but still one I can recommend. Next, we check out Ghost Blaster from Hobbit Games, and if you have a three and a half year old to an eight year old, I highly recommend this memory matching game in which you are going to be a Ghost Blaster going around a mansion trying to blast ghosts in a matching game. But the unique thing about this is, in most matching games, you have to get two matches. In this game, you actually have to get three matches, which kind of blows the kid's mind. Highly recommend. Next, I check out Scythe from Stonemeyer Games, currently on Kickstarter right now. It's already funded, and wow, this game was a lot of fun. It's got gorgeous artwork, it's variable like crazy, it's got asymmetrical powers up to Yale, it's got a cool upgrade system, uh, cool mechs, uh, just lots of good stuff to like in this game. Highly recommend it if you can get past the two hour time limit. Last but not least, I check out the Munchkin Nightmare Before Christmas game, and I must say that I am a Munchkin fan, I've given Munchkin a positive review, I enjoyed it. So, Steve Jackson Games decided to hand this game off to USAopoly, because how bad could they screw up Munchkin, right? Well, they did. They screwed the pooch on this one. They decided to strip away the distinctive artwork. They decided to strip away the humor from this game, and what you're left with is a big box of garbage. That was my week in review. If you enjoyed what I do, be sure to check out this thing. And from me, Star Trek Five Year Mission, did not really like it, didn't think the theme was there, and I felt like there was too, it, it went too long with too many players, and honestly, I felt like you just rolled dice and saw what happened. 
among nobles had a really cool idea of having kids uh, and marrying different people together and just did not work well in the long run for me. Double Mission is a very light game. It looks more about art thieves going around the world stealing art. Just didn't get that feeling as much as I wanted to, but still a solid little game um, of rolling dice and seeing what happens. Pinata Party is kind of a puzzle game as you try to move around and get candy. Um, we're using uh, predetermined movement cards. Each game is a little different, so it's kind of like a different puzzle every game. Sneaky cards. These are cards that you go around the world or around the country, handing them out to people and then watching and tracking these cards as they go different places. Not really a game, but a fun activity. Potion Explosion comes with marbles. That's a cool gimmick where the marbles roll down. It's essentially uh, t taking the many of the different games on the internet where you try to get three in a row or next to each other, things like that, Candy Crush, etc., um, into a board game version. People will like that. Automobiles from AEG, very fun racing game in which you're using a bag building where you pull cubes out and then it shows how you can move on a track and different special abilities you have. Very nice game. Uh, Dice Masters, the new expansion, I talked about that one, The Amazing Spider-Man. My favorite set character-wise, a very solid set, great for people first coming into Dice Masters. Stellar Conflict, this is an amazing uh, re-implementation of Lightspeed, where you put down cards in the table very quickly, like in a minute, and then you see how they all shoot at each other and determine who wins. <laughs> Fun and crazy. And then the Ticket to Ride map pack for number five, Pennsylvania on one side with stock options. On the other side, the UK with technology. Both maps are good. Uh, Pennsylvania can work with new players. UK is definitely for advanced players, but together combined the best map pack that Days of Wonder has done. And that, folks, is what we reviewed last week. Hi, welcome to the 101. Today, we're gonna be learning how to paint armor. So let's get right to it. As you see, we're going to be working with a dwarf here. And as you can see, the only things that we're going to be concerned about, because none of the, the rest of it's black, is the axe, uh, the shoulder pad armor, the helmet, and the chain mail. Now we're going to apply a new oil. Now as you can see, I'm pushing it all into the recesses because I'm trying to get this into the gaps, into the actual uh, shoulder pads and move it around the helmet. So we'll wait for this to dry and we'll take care of it from there. Next, by taking a runefang steel or sterling sil silver and just hitting the edges brings out the armor. It really kind of puts things together going over the edges of the sword in the gr groups without losing the detail of the wash. Now you can see that the armor actually has some character to it and looks bright. And there you go, we've added the Runefang steel and as you can see by putting it in there we got all the detail. Now let me show you a finished dwarf that I've done. With all the colors and everything else added you can see all the detail and how properly the armor looks and how everything comes together. So that's it and that should help you on how to paint, an ar paint armor. So, for more details on how to do armor, go to my YouTube channel, Rob Warren, to see 101 Extended. And don't forget to join Sam and I for battling brushes every week as we do Imperial Assault or whatever game we're doing next. Until next segment, I'm Rob Warren. See you soon. Hello and welcome to Board Games and Bowties. My name is Mike and today we're going to talk about something a little different. We're going to talk about the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund. And if you don't know, the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund is a fund that Tom started um, after a tragic event in his life to help gamers in their hour of need. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means to me. About a year and a half ago, um, I started to get really sick. Something began to destroy my immune system and doctors couldn't figure it out. As months went on, we, uh, it kind of eliminated my ability to walk. Um, my muscles were just too weak. I'm in a wheelchair now most of the time. And doctors still aren't really sure what's going on. So in an event like this, my family really, we didn't know what to do. We, me and my wife had been married just about a year uh, when things started, and we had no idea where to turn to. We had some great friends and great family, um, but not only emotionally were we going through stuff, but financially. The talk, doctors were doing test after test after test and couldn't find anything, and those tests were racking up. Uh, a friend of mine told me about the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund, and we reached out. Um, Tom was quick 
um, to, to find out how they could help. And they reached out, um, relieved a ton of the stress that stuff like this goes through um, financially for my family. And it was an incredible, incredible thing. Uh, we couldn't be here without the Jack Fast Memorial Fund. I don't know what would have happened. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about um, about that. And, and a lot of times we see funds like this and we don't really know who they go to, but but I am somebody who has been directly affected by the Jack Fast Memorial Fund. And it has been an incredible thing for me and my family. Um, so I wanted to tell you that this Wednesday, uh, the auction starts for Jack Fast Memorial Fund. You can find it on Board Game Geek, and it is an incredible way uh, to get involved in what they're doing and to help other gamers like me um, in crazy times of need. These th times are not easy for our families, and so uh, you can you can do that. You can go on, you can bid on items. You can also you can also put items up for auction. If you've got games sitting in the corner that you barely play anymore, put them up. And and honestly, that little thing can help people uh, just like me who uh, are going through some crazy, crazy things in their lives. So I encourage you, go do that. Uh, next week, we'll be back with more uh, tips on how to introduce new people to new games. I'm Mike. This has been Board Games and Bowties. We'll see you later. One of the phrases that has always kind of bugged me, you know, there's things that people say, I could care less, or things like and that drives people nuts, the, in, the grammatically problems with that. But I think that the biggest one is when someone says, well, in my humble opinion, well, the truth is, if it was your humble opinion, you wouldn't share it with us. So you might as well just say, in my opinion, and I don't even think you need to say, in my opinion, most of the time, because most of the things that we say on the internet are opinions. And opinions are just that. We put out our opinions, and there's a lot of times people have talked about reviews, and I've always found it fascinating how people think, there are some people who think that reviews should be objective, and I can't even imagine how that's possible. To me, that's not a review. Yeah, I want to give you my opinion on the game. Um, and there are other people who think that the opinion is the only part of review that matters. And that's fine, although I have a hard time understanding that, because I kind of want to see how the game works. And again, I do my reviews the way that I would want to watch them. And so we'll see a little bit about how the game plays and you know, in, in a fairly quick time frame. And then just hear someone's opinion on whether they liked it or not. And I hope, as I said when I talked about Roger Ebert, that I've done enough reviews that you can tell from my opinions whether or not you like the game. Even if you disagree with me, I might say, well, I didn't like this one. It felt soulless. And you're like, ooh, that sounds really interesting to me. Well, then my job is done. But I think that opinions are important. And I've been talking recently, uh, a, a prominent reviewer basically said, ignore my opinions, don't listen to my opinions at all. And I, I had a conversation with that reviewer and I said, if, if you really didn't want people to listen to your opinions, then you wouldn't give them. I mean, if, if, if you really don't want people to listen to what you say, then you simply won't put it on the internet. By putting it on the internet, you obviously think that what you have to say is worth other people listening to. Now this can lead into very egotistical territory, right? And obviously the title of this video, my opinion is better than yours. And I, and I, and I really don't think that. But honestly, if I'm going to be a reviewer, I have to think that my opinion has some weight or again, I wouldn't share it with you. So why share an opinion at all? Um, the, the, the first reason that I would share an opinion is because I'm so excited about this game and I want other people to play this game. I'm, I mean, that, that was why I started writing reviews to begin with, right? I'm like, oh, wow, this game is amazing. You guys have got to try it out. It's, it's fantastic. And so I would tell other people and it was more of a sharing. And then as time goes by and you get more games, you'd be like, oh, man, I got to tell other people about this game. It's just not that good. Guys, guys, be careful because this game is just not a very fun game. And again, these are opinions. But are the opinions of some people worth more than others? Well, yes, but not maybe in a way that you think I'm leading. I think the opinion of someone who you trust is more important than the opinion of someone you don't know. So I have different friends. Um, you guys know Jason. He's on the thing all the time. If Jason comes and tells me a game is awesome or amazing, that doesn't actually do much for me because I know that Jason likes many games and he thinks that many games are also amazing and our tastes don't always align. Now, they do a lot, but, I, but because our tastes have not as big of a Venn diagram as overlapping as I like, but at the same time we do, 
have an, an overlapping? I can't really tell from him. While on the other hand, I do have different people that I know who when they say, I like this game a lot, I'm like, well, if they like the game, I probably do too. I also have some people in my gaming group who if they tell me they love the game, I go, hmm, probably not going to like it as much. In both cases, both their opinions are more valuable to me. Someone whose opinions are very similar to mine is very valuable to me. And someone whose opinions are diametrically opposed to mine is very valuable to me. Someone who has a lot of overlap, but also a lot of not overlap, again, like with Jason, isn't as useful to me when I just hear their opinion because, yeah, I like a lot of the same games Jason does, but I also don't like a lot of the same games he does. So that's... So when he tells me something's great, it's not as good. Now, the more someone can elaborate on something and they can tell you why they like it, that also makes their opinion more important to me. Someone who just says this game's amazing and then doesn't follow any through, that's not as, that's not as useful to me as someone who can say, I really like this game, here is why I liked it. And they give me all those things. So I do think that opinions can be more important than others, but it's somebody that you trust and like. So maybe my opinion is important to some people who watch the Dice Tower and other people watch it and an opinion's not worth it at all. And that's, that's fine by me. But I obviously, again, have to think my opinion has some weight. I wouldn't put it up there. I think my opinion has some weight because I've played a lot more games than many people. But I would be very cautious in saying my opinion is worth more than the common man. That would be, again, kind of prideful, and I don't ever want it to, 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 for me to come across like that. I'm very strong-willed, and I'm very going to push my opinions strongly on my videos, but if I say this game is garbage, and then you have fun playing it, that's okay. That's great, and that's wonderful, and my opinion in that case is worthless for you. And I've seen on the internet where someone says they saw a game and then they didn't want to get it because of my review or they didn't want to get it because of my review. And occasionally I get emails from people who say, I bought this game because you said it was good and it wasn't. Or the other way around, you said this game was bad and it's really good. Well, fine. So then in that opinion, my opinion was worthless for you. Opinions are worth what you put into them, I suppose. I hope that as a reviewer, and as the reviewers for the Dice Tower, that all my reviewers have done enough reviews that you can look at the body of their work and kind of gauge how important their opinion is to you. You agree with Sam, or Z, or me, or Ryan, and then that person's opinions become invaluable to you. I don't know. What do you guys think? Tell me in the comments. What makes an opinion important and are some opinions more important to you than others? Obviously, our own opinion is the most important, but when we're trying to research in the seven to 800 games that come out in any kind of given months, we can't play them all. So we have to trust other people's opinions, or at least we have to trust our guessing based on sight alone. But what, whose opinions do you really subscribe to? I'd be interested in that. Put them in the comments and maybe it's a good friend or maybe it's someone in your game group. Sometimes it's that person who you don't like what they like, but because of their opinion, you know if you'll like the game or not. Hi there, my name is Niels, Sills Brettspiele, and today we are talking again about my worst and my best favorite mechanism in the Grizzlet from Cool Mini or not. My favorite mechanism for the Grizzlet co-op game, which I really like. It's deeply thematic and it's really good. Uh, correct that this World War game is good. These speech tokens. When it's your time, you can make a little bit of role playing and saying, Friends, we don't have to fear the snow. Believe it, snow is melting again tomorrow. You will see it. We are not fearing that snow. What a great mechanism to add this role playing into that game. Unfortunately, my worst mechanism in the game is the feeling. It's more a feeling than a mechanism. So, Every single decision you have to do in that game is bad. Everything what you're doing is hurting your friends, your opponents. There's not an even single good move in the game. This game creates not, I wouldn't call that frustration, I would call that bad feelings. Every single feeling in that game is bad. Which is semantically correct, but it's a bad feeling. And again, 
please send me a message, an email, comments, whatever you want and tell me about your personal favorite and worst mechanism. This was another episode of the best and the worst mechanism with the Grizzlet, my personal best and worst mechanisms. So see you next time, Cyril's Brettspiele. My name is Niels, bye bye. Hi everybody, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. Kiesling and Kramer is a great game design duo, and I love Euro games, so I was excited to see their game Colbaron or Glukov hit the App Store, but I was really surprised by its implementation, so let's take a quick look. In Glukov, players vie for points by completing coal orders. You must balance your money, your worker pool, types of coal, transportation, and mine shaft build out through three compounding scoring rounds. It's actually pretty simple, but it provides some great decision making. I have never seen an app implementation like Glukov, in which they basically abandon the concept of a board entirely for this 3D rendered environment combined with 2D game elements. Kudos for innovation and creativity. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work well. And beyond the issues the 3D and board abandonment causes, there are just lots of little things that weren't thought through. The number on the carts is barely readable, even on an iPad. Selected actions don't highlight, and the controls aren't intuitive. The tutorial is more of an on-screen action definition aid, and it does little to teach you the game or interface. Your game isn't saved if you shut down the app, and even though it has pass and play, I can't imagine trying to play the game that way. And there's no online play and only one AI difficulty. It is a complete slog to learn how to use the app, let alone play the game. I wish the developers had poured the time spent on rendering odd-looking characters into usability studies and interface and feature improvements. The game behind the app is a really great Euro that's very rewarding and fun, and it deserves a great app. Sadly, this version does the gameplay no favors. If you're desperate for a new Euro to play on your iPad, this may be worth it to you. But really, with its extensive usability issues, I can't recommend you give it a try. So let's take a look here at the Stonemeyer's Resource Vault. This is the second of their three boxes. And this one, actually, I'm really conflicted about this one. Because of the three, I think this one has my favorite pieces. And yet, of the three, I think this is the one I will use the least. Now, I really do like these little ore bars. These actually have a metallic feel to them. And I love, love these little barrels. These barrels are really good. They look great. Here's a little sacks of goods that you can have. Here's a bundle of cloth. Yes, it's not a blue cube. Here's a thing of yarn. And here's a bucket of water. I would love to use these in games, except most of the games that I keep don't end up having these pieces in them. But I'm gonna find some game that these will fit into. I'll certainly be able to get these in the barrels into some game or other. I'm not sure how often I'll use the buckets, but if, if you play Euro games at all that have a lot of different cubes of different types, usually red, yellow, pink, and they stand for different kinds of resources, these would be a great addition to that. This box comes with these in it and bags. I'm sure you won't keep it in here very long. It's just a way to upgrade some of your games, but these are really well sculpted. High marks from me. This is the Resource Vault from Stonemeyer's Games. Greetings YouTube, this is Dean with Board Game Social bringing you part three of our discussion of insurance and insuring your collection. So today we're going to take a look at the idea of business property and how that differs from your own personal property. Ask ourselves a few questions. Am I being compensated somehow for that collection? Do I have a blog? Do I have a YouTube channel where I'm somehow being compensated? And it can be a very little amount of compensation. All right, it could be selling advertising space on your blog. It can be having that AdSense on your YouTube channel. And I know everybody wants to make that five cents a day in the ads on YouTube, but those things can move your collection from personal to business very fast. All right, do you receive free games? Are you being paid to take your collection to a convention and run a games library? To ask yourself, am I running the risk of losing my protection under my personal property and being having my collection put into a business property category? And why is it important? Because under your homeowner's policy, or under your renter's policy, 
business property has a limited amount of money that you are covered for. And it's usually around $1,000, maybe a little more, depends on the company. So I don't want you to find yourself in a catastrophic loss and thinking that you have a collection that's all personal property and it's really going to be viewed as business property. And today with social media, YouTube, Facebook, it doesn't take much for an insurance company to, to make that determination. So review, your, review how you are using your collection and you make that determination and check with your agent if you think you might need more coverage. All right, join me next time when we take a look at the dreaded backup of sewer and drain. And until then, take care of yourselves. Hey there, Mikhail here for Snakes and Lattes with another episode of The Improv Gamer. For the most part, we've been looking at party games, bluffing games, and social deduction games. But here I've got a numbers game, Kobiakawa. You can replicate Kobayakawa easily with a standard deck of 52 cards and some coins. Um, here we've co-opted the coins from another game, but you can use whatever you have at hand as long as each unit can represent one. You will need exactly four coins per player and eight for the central pool. You'd also need to take one to ten, so the ace to the ten, of one suit in your deck of cards and then the ace to the five of another suit. At the beginning of each round, each player, starting with the starting player, is dealt a card. Starting player being represented by the ship here, of course. And then a central card is added to the middle. Starting with the starting player, everyone is then entitled to take one action. There are two possible actions. One is to draw a card from the deck and look at the two cards you have in your hand. You can keep one of them and discard the other face up. Another action is to simply replace the central card with another card blind off the top of the deck. Here we've turned a 10 into a 13. This is useful because the player with the lowest value card still remaining in the hand gets to add the central card to his or her total. So with the small knowledge that watching each player's one action provides, we now enter the bidding phase. Starting with the starting player, you have to ante up one unit or doubloon in order to participate in the round. The winner of the last hand becomes a new starting player. All the cards are returned to the central deck and cards are dealt anew. This will continue on for seven rounds. If you ever lose your entire stack of cash, you are out of the game. The last round is worth two doubloons. Though if you only have one left, you can still ante up just one to participate. The winner of the hand not only receives a starting player token, but also all of the bids that were made during that round, in addition to one from the central bank. And that's it for this time, folks. It is now time for me to get cracking on Dice Tower, and then to get cracking on, well, sorting everything out. And there's so many things to, to get jumping on, but we will be doing that. From now till the end of the year, Dice Tower is going to turn into Review Central. You won't see as many top 10s and top 100 stuff from us, but instead you're just going to see reviews, 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 and reviews of games. I hope that you do enjoy that. I hope to see you guys next week. Come back on Thursday, watch Board Game Blender. It's essentially the same thing as this show, but with Z Garcia's spin on things. So go check that out. Until then, I'll see you, and I'm Tom Vassell. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.